So this is what I'd like to cover today. I mean, uh, just this may be a recap for, for some, but just a little bit about our perspective on pipeline integrity, what, what the objectives are. I think that's, that's really background. And then the background really to digitalization, there's something that we're calling the industry quadrilemma. Some technology opportunities that have come about through advances. Typical, what we feel are typical operator scenarios. Um, multiple new and shared data sources that are available now. And then the fourth industrial revolution, how that might apply to pipeline integrity. Um, our vision for our for our cloud based service here and where we are with it, where Pensman are with this and what we see as challenges and uh, potential roadblocks uh, to this this type of thinking and te technology. So next slide, please. So pipeline is pipeline integrity management. Uh, there's a there's a broader concept that most operators will be familiar with, which will be um, enterprise enterprise risk management. So this would cover all kinds of risks. Could be uh, riots, pandemics, um, currency currency fluctuations, or oil price. And part of part of the part of that risk is the risk that the asset poses to the environment, people, reputation, and business. And that could be wrapped up in one umbrella called asset integrity management. And we're really focusing on one part of it is pipeline integrity management. But there are structural integrity management programs uh, and um, and uh, well integrity uh, well integrity ma management systems as well. So it's so that's pipeline. That's, that's our view of pipeline integrity management. It's part of enterprise risk management. Next slide, please. Over the years. And some of you will be familiar with these. A lot of codes and standards have been generated that actually have a perspective on this and provide provide guidance. Uh, Pensmen have been involved in developing these uh, these methodologies, uh, auditing clients and developing systems of clients for many many years. And we've come up with what we call the 17, 17 elements view, which is really, in our view, what everything you need to effectively manage pipeline integrity. And this is a matrix that compares uh, the various codes and standards with with that view. And you can see ISO 55000 is, is a very, very general uh, standard on, on asset management, you know, broadly covers broadly covers all these topics. So we know. We have a lot of guidance about how to actually, actually go undertake this task. So next slide, please. Another way of looking at it really is is risk management throughout the life throughout the life of the throughout the life of the pipeline and, and really when we start off this is the, the design phase that i'm showing here the vertical axis is risk horizontal axis is time in the design phase you don't actually have you're not really exposing people the environment and your business to risk or very very minimal risk so you're really predicting forward uh, what that risk might be so you're doing you're undertaking um studies like um, hazards and um, fmeas and then you 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 reduce that risk by design until it's as low as reasonably practical. So you put those reduction measures in place. So then you go through the construction phase. During that phase, not nothing much changes. Your 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 future predicted risk is the same. But then you go into operation. And whilst it's an operation, this is where you start to get you start to get uh, degradation. Uh, the horizontal line uh, dotted line is is what we consider to be an intolerable level of risk. And at some point you intervene and that could be depressurization, that could be undertaking a repair or in fact inspecting alone, just inspecting won't change your risk, but it gives you the opportunity to do something which will change your risk, but it decreases uncertainty. So you it, you can discover uh, the condition of your line and then you continue to go through, go through that process with in, intervening, uh, undertaking, undertaking, taking repairs or other or other kind of mitigating actions. And eventually it becomes intolerable. Uh, and ideally, this would happen the day before you you want you want your field becomes like uneconomic. So I mean, when you when you do a remaining life study, that's what you're trying to achieve effectively. You want your your system to become unacceptably the risk to become unacceptable about the same time or just shortly before you know you you need your the end of the end of the required life effectively. And then after that, depressurize it, decommission it. And there's just a little bit, yeah. And then you actually, interestingly enough, in most cases, it's very difficult to abandon an asset completely. You always have a residual, some kind of residual risk. It's for an offshore line, 
that might be a risk to um, to the environment, to fishing for a longshore line. If it's a large diameter, that could be risk to um, other land users, uh, risk to watercourses, etc. So it's it's very hard to completely eliminate eliminate risk. So in a pipeline integrity management system, this is what we're trying to achieve in 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 you know in general general terms, managing the risk of our assets throughout throughout the life. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. This is an observation that, that we've made that, that I'm, I hope some of you will be familiar, familiar with. We're calling it the industry quadrilemma. So it's four things that make us as pipeline integrity, as integrity engineers make our life a bit more difficult. The first one is an increase in, in, increased risk of failure. And that's because you may have heard the term bathtub, bathtub uh, curve. So at the beginning of, beginning of an asset's life, you, you get um, early life failures, and then typically you have a, a fairly long period of, of, of stability, and then you start to get the wear out phase and you start to get failures. And a lot of assets around the world are actually in this, in this wear out phase. Many, many assets are way beyond their initial design life. I mean, in the US, many pipelines more than 50 years old, there's certainly 50 year old pipelines in the UK as well. Second point is the scarcity of resources. You know, for one reason or the other, um, fewer people have been coming into the oil into the oil and gas business. Uh, people have been retiring. The average age is 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 very high compared with compared with other in industries. Uh, and it takes a long time to train a pipeline integrity engineer. And also one and two here play together because the skill set is changing. You know, the requirements for for skills related to aging assets is different. Than they are for for a, for a business as usual as usual asset. So they one and two work work together to uh, compound the problem. The third one, more and more legislation. Governments are certainly aware of uh, aware of or regulators aware of uh, the, the potential uh, liabilities with aging assets, and also there's there's legislation regarding abandonment of assets. Uh, so you, you may be required to continue to operate your asset, um, even though you don't actually have a use for it because it's strategic infrastructure effectively. So there's more and more legislation, more and more prescriptive uh, legislation. Uh, and also the fourth one, you know, is a new financial outlook. Uh, volatility of oil prices reduces um, reduces confidence in investment and also you know, a lot of fields are at that plateau as well, so producing less, producing less oil. So uh, there's there's just le less money around, budgets are tighter. So those all these things work work together to make life difficult for operators. You know, they've got more problems to worry about, harder to hire people, more requirements from a legislation point of view, and less money less less money going around. So so that's the industry background. Next slide, please. And in the meantime, we've got substantially evolving technology. These slides are about increasing in, increasing in computer, computing power. The uh, graph on the left shows increasing in computing power between 2000 and 2017. And you can see we've got roughly 10,000 times more processing power in 2000 in 2017 than we have in, we have in 2000. The cost of storage is, is radically, radically cheaper. And the amount of data that's collected is uh, is radically higher as well. So, so we have cheap storage, uh, high high computing power. And on the right, uh, you may have come across the, the term Moore's law. This is the uh, uh, the performance of central uh, or CPU central processing unit units uh, on a single thread, and there they are multiplying roughly 1.5 uh, times per year. And interestingly enough, you know, around 2000, the, the, the technology for start to started to use um, graphical processor units. The difference between a, between a CPU and a GPU is a CPU has up, you know, typically maximum of about 16 processors, more typically four, four or eight. But GPUs, even though the processor is more si a lot simpler, they can have thousands, potentially 2000, even more than even more than 2000 and getting greater. So computing power is uh, is is massively more than you know and developing uh, yearly so next slide please the other thing that's happening a lot in the background is you know is cloud computing and i think the first point is with software as a service you can get enterprise class 
very high reliability um, hardware, really with snap your, snap your fingers with something like Amazon Web, Web Services Azure. You can just en enter your credit card details and, it, and it's there up and running, up and running. Very, 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 very reliable. But also on top of that, we've got a lot of different web services um, with maps, payments, um, accessing data, storing data, optical character recognition, much, much more. A lot of it's absolutely free, or if it's not free, it's very, 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 very low cost, or it's pay as you pay as you go. Um, also, there's you know collaboration all around the world, developing open source codes. You know some of the most some of the most uh, advanced computer search uh, research is being done using open open source codes. Some examples are which we're actually using ourselves: MongoDB, Postgres, Postgres SQL, Kubernetes, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, Java, Angular are all all examples uh, free to use. Um, you know, and, and developing and developing and very and, and very powerful. So this is very, very empowering uh, for for industry or, um, you know, everybody as a whole effectively. So it gives fantastic opportunities there for collaboration and, and, and problem solving across all industries. Next slide, please. And really expectations as well. We've got faster computers. We've got all sorts of cloud based services available. And I think we all ex we all expect things to be to be available in a few clicks. And Amazon's a good example. You know, you can search for something in the, in the morning, a few clicks, and it arrives the next day or even the same day if you're if you're living in a city. So, you know, people can find new skills, buy things, listen to music, read books, all on all very very quickly, extremely quickly, um, just just over over the over the internet. So. So the way in we are interacting with data has radically changed, and really there's no there's no going back. You know we, that that's the way things are going to be going going forward. Next slide, please. However, Pensman have been looking at pipeline integrity management systems and working off with operators for for many many years, and uh, kind of no disrespect, but. Uh, I would say that most, even the most sophisticated operators, still have a proliferation of spreadsheets. Uh, you know, multiple um, legacy ERP systems, a lot of manual manual uh, movement of data between between systems. Um, and you know, this this with the uh, lack of resources means it's 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 very hard uh, without the interoperability. It, you know, it's quite it's hard to get insights, hard to make decisions. You know, there's a dependence on contract as well. So it's it's as I said, even the most sophisticated operators operators struggle str struggle struggle with this. Um, next slide, please. And not surprisingly, really, the, you know, the 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 oil and gas industry as a whole. This is some work that was done by uh, by Deloitte's, and they developed a digital maturity um, index in um, index. And the oil and gas um, agency in the in the UK uh, actually undertook undertook this research with that using their maturity index, and you can see oil and gas oil and gas compared with all these other in industries, you know, is one is is one of the lowest. Uh, you know, if you compare it with with telecoms, uh, hosp hospitality, travel, banking, securities, you know, it's very 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 low down on the list really. So, next slide, please. And the background as well. There is more and more, more and more data sources, uh, more and more autonomous sensors are being developed uh, for, for, for real time or, or, or quasi real time data. Uh, sensors to measure strain, uh, curvature, vibration, position pressure. Also to monitor CP systems, to um, undertake uh, corrosion assessments, uh, to measure coupons and sensors, and also online online systems as well for things like weather and forecasting, things like uh, Wave uh, predictions and wave wave and wind predictions, and also connection to third-party systems as well. Uh, just systems that are that are that are quite common now in the industry. OSI Soft is one example. Data Historian and uh, System Control and Data uh, Data Acquisition Systems, SCADA Systems. So we've got a lot of a lot of data, a lot of new data sources uh, coming coming to play. So then that relates to that explosion of data I just talked about. Next slide, please. And, and advantages and, and advances in data sources as well. This is just one particular uh, 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 system, which is using uh, using a satellite 
to actually uh, measure uh, ground ground movements. So it's applying a, a synthetic thin, synthetic aperture radar or SARS. You'd have heard of lidar, but typically lidar has to be taken from a from a relatively uh, from a, a vehicle or plane relatively close to the ground, and it's and it's quite a, quite expensive. But this technology actually allows us to to measure ground movement um, with a satellite. So much, much more convenient, potentially a lot cheaper. Typically, uh, it's being used now for uh, building um, settlements, but no reason why it couldn't be used for pipelines. So it's uh, and it can get sub sub centimeter measurements of ground displacement. So it's 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 very accurate. So next slide, please. And faster and better data sources. And these are two 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 examples of uh, digitalization in terms of data data gathering. The first is the, the, the handheld 3D laser scanner. Um, typically, if um, substan substantial external corrosion is found uh, during during a DCVG survey, they might expose expose the pipeline, and if and, and actually undertake um, pit measurements using using a pit gauge, and this would then be used to actually under, to undertake an assessment uh, to under to understand what the remaining life is to undertake a repair. So this is quite quite a tedious exercise but with a hand a handheld 3d laser scanner you don't it doesn't require any particular sophisticated setup you can just get pointed at it it's got it has a stereo laser uh, and it will do a very very accurate a very very accurate um calculation of the surface of outside surface of the pipeline and it actually has built-in analysis and diagnosis software as well so <clears throat> very very quick three times the speed and actually four times the resolution of a pit gauge as well so, and then the bottom one is um, fast digital imaging inspection. This is for um, uh, subsea uh, survey of survey of pipelines. This historically was done by by using a video from a from an ROV, and then uh, uh, which is has to go relatively slowly to capture the data. But actually, things typically don't happen that quickly along on pipelines. So what happens with this uh, fast digital imaging inspection is that it, it goes something like five times the speed and takes very, very high definition photographs um, intermittently along the pipeline. And with this, they can actually produce um, 3D models. It can actually uh, combine um, side scan multi beam laser, high definition images, field gradients, non-contact CP and uh, data all simultaneously. So again, five times quicker. So, so faster and much, much better data sources. So. Next slide, please. Some of the audience may have heard about um, Industry 4.0, um, and this is something that's really um, sweeping a lot of industries and being a benefit to a lot of industries around the world. Um, so, really just explain um, Industry 1.0, steam, steam energy, a long time ago in the 18th century, and then we had uh, Industry 2.0, electrical power, Industry 3.0, automation. And now we have um, Industry 4.0, hyper hyper con connectivity. So it, this includes um, interconnection, the um, industrial internet of things, use of art artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data and live data. And that is affecting a lot of industries around the world. So, so the interesting question is, you know, how could that how could that relate to how could that relate to pipelines for us? Next slide, please. So one one important area is uh, certainly align, aligning data. Uh, we we undertake we undertake inspection to to understand the condition of our of our of our uh, of our asset or a pipeline, whether that's from on the inside or or the, or the outside uh, using using very various techniques. But if you want to actually predict it for the future, then the best way to do it <clears throat> is to actually um, undertake another survey. Uh, at, a, at an appropriate time, and then match match this data match this data together. So we found using you know using uh, some of these mathematical techniques, we can we can very very accurately match data together. Whether it's based on um, the shape of the pipeline uh, curvature, or it's based on the uh, the weld the weld uh, the pipeline the section lengths weld, welds, or based on individual on individual defects. So the the ability to align data is is very very critical critical because if you can align data, you can actually under, you can actually undertake an assessment. You can calculate the degradation rate and actually use that to um, to predict to predict a remaining remaining life. 
and that that might be uh, one or two or three or four or many many data sets. So we found that using um, you know computer science. This can be done, but this can be done very, very effective, really. So the benefit here is, you know, better failure predictions, um, better, better, much better decisions um, in, um, you know, in, in, in calculating things like remaining life. So next slide, please. And allowing us to do that gives us a better, better under, an understanding of degradation. So, I mean, typically, um, Typically, this is uh, corrosion rates have been calculated as one figure along the whole length of the pipeline. But I think using these more sophisticated techniques allows us to actually ca calculate credible corrosion growth rates along the length of the line. So actually allows us to actually change our strategy depending where, on, where we are on the line. So the variances along the line could be could be caused by different soil characteristics, could be caused by different operating temperatures. One end of the line versus the other could be caused by um, different construction techniques that could pick up things like uh, preferential well corrosion due to um, field joint uh, coating issues or preferential well, well, well corrosion just to um, uh, the, the cathodic and anodic um, differences, you know, in, in, on the in the inside the pipeline. So, so again, more sophisticated analysis gives us a better understanding of mechanisms uh, and allows us to have better better failure pred uh, predictions, more optimum, more optimum repairs. Uh, Next slide, please. And also, <clears throat> better computing power allows us to 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 delve more into the probabilistic assessment as well. Um, typically, a lot of a lot of work in the in the integrity area area is actually done deterministically. So, with a deterministic analysis, you take into account of um, Uncertainty by allow, by allowing uh, by including safety factors, for example, including a safety factor in the yield strength of, of material. You include safety factors in the uh, choice of tolerances for uh, for your measuring device, your tool. You include uh, uh, tolerances in, uh, in 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 the pressure, operating pressure. So this you can end up with quite conservative quite conservative results. You know, partic particularly if you're doing something which requires a lot of variables like remaining life. Doing it deterministically, you end up necessarily do, doing it for, in very, very conservative way. So, a much better way of doing this is to actually take account of the variation in the in the various um, the various data or inlets or inputs, and also in the equations themselves. Uh, this allows you to actually take a take a you know a, a, a p50 result on an average or or a p90. So, it's a much more sophisticated way of of taking taking account of uncertainty. But numerically, it's a lot more complicated. Um, you may have heard of the term structural reliability analysis. So there is um, the first order reliability method, second order reliability method. These are computationally uh, quite hard to make to make robust. There is a very robust uh, way um, which is often used called simulation or Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo simulation. But this is very computationally expensive. You know, it can take literally um, hours months or even years to actually undertake a, a, a calculation if you're looking for a very, very, uh, very, very low probability. But with uh, modern computers, certainly with uh, GPU uh, parallelization, which have, you know, a thousand plus processors for online services or 2000 for 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 for, uh, for, uh, for actual cards. And also using other techniques like uh, you can uh, you can populate a surface uh, based on Monte Carlo simulation, then you could fill in you can fill in the gaps basically using using interpolation, um, and also there are other techniques like uh, like uh, using subset simulation for uh, for further optimization. So really, faster computing uh, and use of um, machine learning can can you know can actually bring the, bring these probabilistic uh, methods into a more practical into a more practical domain. Um, so the, the benefit really is probabilistic remaining life, uh, probabilistic net present value. You know, you can say that the, you know the, there's a the, there's a 90 percent chance of your remaining life being X. So it just really leads to more informed, better decisions. Really taking account of safety and um, uncertainty in a in a more logical and scientific way. Next slide, please. Automation. 
very much part of pipeline pipeline 4.0 industry 4.0 <clears throat> typically going through going through survey data um, using a using a human methodology can be very 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 tedious I mean a good example is external survey data if you use a three hour if you if you do a three hour video along a pipeline you literally have to sit, sit there for three hours and watch it it's possible to speed it up a bit but it's easy to miss something if you do that so <clears throat> in other in other sciences particularly medical science um, it's been it's been discovered that using um, convolutional neural networks these are actually better than the, than the human eye and detecting detecting features or classifying classifying features you do this by actually uh, having a, a set of um, training images and then you you train that you train the neural network that then to detect the features so this means you can actually go through the video frame by frame using the neural neural network to detect, to, to detect the features and then highlighting them um, generally speaking, uh, you may have to actually go back and, and review it, but it should be a very, very good at, at, at giving a very, very first pass to see if anything very critical um, has been found. If there's any real um, showstoppers. Um, the examples on the right are pipeline spans. Sorry, I haven't got to finish that one. Pipeline spans, weight coding damage, uh, movements. So this type of data. Um, we can do we can use this for ILA ILA data, you know, predicting uh, predicting or, or looking for particular features in the data. We can use it for CP data, external video images or, or internal damage. And you know, it's, there's been quite a lot of success in this really. So benefit faster, better indication of anomalies really. So next slide please. Also analysis of complex features. Um, <clears throat> Quite often, when we have complex features, could be the interaction uh, between various anomalies in a pipeline. Um, off, more often than not, it's easy just to simplify it and, and, and make some very, very, uh, very, very conservative judgment. But there are more sophisticated methods, but they are again very, very complex, very, very um, complex, well, not co not complex, but um, computationally expensive. This is actually an example of a, of a five meter long defect. Um, and it's been been analysed um, probabilistically, which would which using conventional techniques uh, would have, would have been an extremely um, onerous um, onerous from a computational point of view. Again, using uh, using GPU computing and and uh, artificial intelligence can be done very 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 quickly. So, so really, what the benefit here is 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 better better much better decisions, much better predictions. Um, in four, com four complex dis uh, defects, so it could be interact things like interacting dents, um, interacting interacting anomalies, for, ex for example. So, next slide, please. And this one, I think, is a really interesting one. Really, um, if you've got real time data, you know, if you if you're applying um, industry four point or pipeline four point zero um, principles, you can be collecting real real time real time data. So you can use this, for example, to um, calculate uh, fatigue life on, on, on the fly. You can you can take account of variations in variations in uh, product uh, product composition, taking out variations in, in pressure and use this to actually uh, with a digital twin. Effectively, you can calculate real time uh, cost cost of failure. You can uh, calculate the real time uh, uh, real time Net present value or, re or economics, um, <clears throat> and real you know real time uh, time to next expansion, etc. So, so really, this gives you a better understanding of uh, long term consequences of operating, better better scenarios, uh, better decisions. So, next slide, please. A faster turnaround of data as well. This is um, the general uh, going from a, running a tool. To, to to obtaining a report historically you know we from our own experience and I know a lot of a lot of um, inspection companies are, are already doing this to be fair but typically you'd, you'd run the tool download the data and this would be an enormous enormous amount of data these could have been actually couriered put onto a onto a hard disk couriered couriered to a, to a to a lab they would actually process, process the data they'd actually produce a written report which will be then, uh, you know, then reviewed, sent sent off to a client. But uh, 
you know, within within a pipeline 4.0 environment, the reason why you can't run at all, upload the data to the cloud. You can you can do your automatic anomaly detection, so you can give an extremely early prediction of um, of any any real um, serious issues. Process the data in the cloud um, using uh, cloud technology, uh, computational power, and actually deliver the report to your client in the cloud as well. So the benefit here really is that much much faster speed, much much faster between um, between you know running the tool and, and getting and getting getting the results. So and better and better results. Next slide, please. So really taking all this into into the consideration. Um, you know, Pennspade have been in the pipeline integrity business now for about 20, 25 years plus, probably even 30 years. So we set about to to create uh, uh, a pipeline integrity management system in, in the in, in the cloud. Um, and really the vision we had for this really that it would be native cloud based, taking advantage of the of the, uh, the most up to date cloud based computing. So not virtual machine or remote desktop, but actually completely native cloud. So all you need is a browser to make it work. We, we knew we'd never complete with ERP solutions, Maximo, Esri, SAP, SAP, for example. You know, we're in a different, we're, we, you know, we're providing subject matter ex expertise. Um, so we wanted to really just to be allow, allow these systems to be integrated and take data from these systems to do to do better, better analysis. Also data in ingestion as well. We just want it to be drag, drag and drop so that you don't have to do lots of lots of lots of formatting, which we which typically has been done in the past. Um, so alignment alignment between data sets will, will be automatic. So smart recognition of any kind of format really. Also da data and document management. We know that operators with even a relatively small pipeline network, just a few pipelines over many years will develop quite a complex data management requirement. So operators with hundreds of pipelines, you know, have a, have a very, very large data management um, data management task. Um, so to build in document management, we thought was an inherent part really of of of, of, uh, of this system. Also to access live data feeds. For dynamic things like dynamic lifecycle costing and KPIs, remaining life is set to time to next inspection, exp next inspection. We thought that was very that was a very important part of our vision. Also flexibility. <clears throat> particularly in defining um, key performance indicators. We've actually observed and set up a lot of key performance indicators for our clients, but I'd say there's, no, there's really no two the same. They're all very, they're all very, all very, very different. Um, so we, 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 our vision really is to create a system for clients where they can be totally, totally uh, flexible based on organization or individual pipelines. Um, also role based portals makes things simpler. You know, we have different people potentially involved in this, so it'd be um, CP engineers and and uh, asset managers. So the important thing really is to only provide information that's relevant to that person to make it straightforward. Also, we've got we have a, we've invested a lot over the years in in e-learning material related to pipeline integrity. We want that to be built into the system. We want a, in a similar way document libraries, so access to um, methodology um, and standards can be built into the system. Also benchmarking. Uh, what we mean by benchmarking is comparing, comparing uh, an operator's pipeline pipeline integrity management system based on some sort of um, qualitative uh, methodology with others, so you can compare and actually plot your progress. And of course, the last one, which is very important, of course, enhanced security and control of data, needs to be needs to, needs to be very very good, of course, to be to be um, acceptable to operators. So next slide, please. So Penn's been um, 20. We had you know roughly 25 years in, in this business. We've developed a lot of a lot of code and methods, but never really a cloud-based solution. So uh, to, to, so to solve this, we actually partnered work with a, with a uh, company called QIO, who um, who have who are um, have developed a industrial anal analytics platform. And have a number of um, a number of uh, key clients, including Rolls Royce, so using you know using using this system. So we built we built our product, which we call Thea, um, on their system, and that gives us a lot of things for free. Uh, and you see that the their platform is in three layers: a data layer, a model layer, and an application layer. 
So within with the data layer, we get by using the QI, QI platform a way to actually connect to edge computers, to connect to real real time uh, devices, and if there's an API, we can connect to it. So that allows us to connect to to things like um, SAP, Maximo, um, Esri, for example, or we can drag in we can drag in files and, in, and ingest those. So. So the bottom layer, you can see the right hand side, we can actually have visualization engineers and data engineers to actually understand the data. And then we use our subject matter experts for the next layer. We develop we develop models that includes our um, risk assessments, uh, our integrity assessments. So this is where we our, our main input really is. And then we turn that into applications which transfer to the application layer for our for our client. Um, and this system is multi tenants. So it, it doesn't require a separately hosted um, um, instance for any particular operator. It can all be um, it can be shared amongst amongst other operators. It doesn't preclude them from having their own system, of course. So this is how this is this is how the system works. It's a lot more complicated, of course, but in you know in very very general terms. So we built it on the QIO's industrial analytics platform, so we get a lot of this functionality kind of for free, effectively. So next slide, please. So where are we with it? We're some way, some way about a year or so into the into our development now. Obviously, one of the one of the very important things is getting data into it. So um, we've we've developed a drag and drop methodology. So uh, that that was one of the one of the challenges. So we recognise all the various different various different columns you can potentially have from comma separated separated variable files or Excel files. Um, and if, and the way the way it works is that that we have a large number of build, a large number of these reckon these file formats in there. If you if a, a user comes across one that doesn't exist, then it's possible to model it. There is actually a, a way of picking the columns and choosing them, and then that can be saved so we have it for the future. So the more it's used, the more it learns, the better the ingestion routine is. The other thing is getting from from um, SQL to Thea. We can accept we can accept a pods database or any in fact any, any other lay, lies data source as well using a number of different protocols so so the largely due to the qio platform is 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 pretty good at ingesting ingesting data so next slide please we thought it's very very important that one of our early early uh, module developments um, was around uh, dashboards pretty much all clients uh, like like i want dashboards um, so we came up with a completely flexible flexible system. It can take data from within Thea, in other words, the results of your calculations outside of Thea, which could be manually entered. It connect to connect to other systems. It connect to uh, it can connect to third party systems. Top right is a matrix a matrix view where you can see all your pipelines across the top, all the different criteria uh, down the side, and then uh, traffic light system. Which uh, you know, um, and it, that, again, the traffic light system is to totally customizable, with up to five five different colors uh, if required. And then there's also there's a there's a status, a current status perspective. But also you can toggle between the current status and also a trend as well, so you can see how your KPIs are actually varying varying with time. And again, you can see um, the bottom right bottom there. We've got various graphs and, the, and we've got the traffic light colors replicated on the graphs as well. So we can have a field overview. We can have a trend overview and we have organizational KPIs as well, which could be progress against um, competencies or progress against hiring or it could be um, progress against overall in inspection targets or budget. So again, you know, completely flexible. For the operator to um, you know design and and uh, create and as they as they desire. So next slide, please. <coughs> the other thing we managed to do is um is you know we've got the uh, the the ILI assessment uh, routines all built in here, so you can drag your data in. You can set the criteria that you want that you want to um, the, the assessment the methodology you want to use. Um, you can immediately get you can immediately get results in a, in a, in a, in a graphical, explorable uh, form, and then you can actually create a, a, an automated report. And the automated report has the methodology, which varies depending on what assessment you're doing. It has a, it has a narrative, it has a conclusion, it has a summary of the data, 
and it has um, insights that have been developed from from the analysis as well. And it's the way we've written it is actually can be done in multi -lang multiple languages as well. You can see the one the example here is actually in Spanish. So next slide, please. And e-learning. Over the last 20 years or so, we've um, Pentiment have developed a very large um, uh, um, set of e-learning um, material, and it's about it's about something like ten and a half thousand thousand slides. It's in um, e-learning format, so SCORM format. In fact, HTML5, and this is actually built into the into the FIA, FIA platform. And it covers defect assessment, geohazards, uh, pipeline materials, on onshore and offshore pipeline engineering, and risk risk management. So you can actually dip in, dip into this as a search routine. So you can actually search search for the slides you want. Just use it to get the background on the assessment you're doing, or you can systematically go through it. And it's actually up to um, up to university postgraduate level. This was actually used on on, on a couple of postgraduate programs in here in the UK and also in Mexico as well. So next slide, please. And obviously vis data visualization very very important as well superimposing um, pipeline pipeline shapes display shapes from from one set of data versus the other superimposing um, profiles against um, against maps again very important the bottom right example there is where a pipeline is displaced um, quite quite considerably you know you, you can pick it up very very quickly. So you can use um, algorithms to, 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 to detect insights within your data, and then you can use the data visualization to actually drill down to where that actually is on your on your pipeline length. So, so you can you can very very quickly find problematic areas uh, before the before you know before the before the situation escalates. So again, you know, very quick route to to a prognosis, diagnosis, and and uh, determining the outcome required. So. Next slide, please. So saying that, you know, we've um, we invested a lot of time and money in this, but I think there are we you know, have there are some challenges we've come across. Certainly from the uh, from the automation of anomaly detection, you need a lot of data, and this is probably more than one operator has. So I think there's a lot of a lot of benefit here in in you know in, in collaboration. Um, so the data, if they operators were to pull their data, I think there'd be a lot of benefit in doing that to get to get to get a, a better, faster prognosis. Also, it's quite a bit of investment in legacy legacy systems, getting people to adopt new things when they've already invested in in, in you know in software and their own methodology. Again, it, it, part of that, I guess, is about change management. You have to have obviously a compelling case. Cost of sensorization, <clears throat> and also the communication part of it as well. It's certainly very high risk um, um, issues or certainly for very specific areas you know it does make a lot of sense you know to put sense strain gauges on pipelines that you that are subject to moving but actually putting sensors along a whole pipeline is very is very expensive really and I think it's only really justified if there is if there are very high consequences of failure so there is a you know a big a big gain to gain to be had you know for, um, also, lack of drop into operability between between I systems again is a, is a challenge. Uh, you know, most operators complain about this. Operators have very very sophisticated systems, but, but still end up manually uh, transporting data between between one and one and the other. Um, also, we've had some some issues with um, lack of common data formats. There are some standards around. Uh, there's pods. The uh, pipeline open data standard, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, there are some new ones being developed as well, and of course security concerns. Some uh, some operators just won't accept a cloud environment. So, but I but I think that I think that is, I think that is uh, changing. So, next slide, please. And I think another 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 observation here, which is. Um, which I think is an important one is that you know we're we're providing theory as a software as a service, um, but do operators do operators really want to do all this by themselves? Uh, you know we, cer we we certainly hope so, and we're certainly encouraging that. Some 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 already do. Um, some hopefully could be persuaded to do it themselves. Mm. 
And there is, you know, there is a solution, and we would call it an augmented consultancy. This is where Pensmore would actually use these tools to give a to give a better service and provide the information using, you know, using FIA, but the client uh, the client just gets the results; they don't actually undertake the work themselves. So this is we call this aug augmented consultancy. Um, the other important issue, I think, is that you know the routine tasks tend to be uh, dealt with very very quickly using using FIA. And this gives uh, this gives people time to actually provide better results to their client, better insights. Um, and the other thing is that you know the development of this and the use of the, the use of this this these type of systems are driving new skill sets as well. Pipeline and subsea engineers of the future, I think, will need to have digital skills. And I think engineers who possess both mechanical pipeline and digital competencies are likely to become the key people as well. I think the ability to to use these systems and get insights. And define actions, uh, you know, is an incredibly important skill. So, but I think this is important. You know, we talked about the difficulty in recruiting in oil and gas, uh, which is a real issue. You know, I think if we're recruiting people in um, with with data, where if you're mixing in data management into the skills and data science, I think this makes a much more attractive, attractive career path. So, next slide, please. And there are some positives with regards to security as well. There's, an, there's, a, there's a standard ISO 27001, which has very, very clear guidelines about security. You can have ingress or, or ingress audits, or what we call ethical hackers. Also, multi-factor authentication as well. And uh, you know, um, the other possibilities with private cloud. You know, if, if, if multi-tenant is not is not acceptable, it's possible to do it completely privately within an operator's own own secure environment. And I think an example of how things are changing in the world is generally is that Microsoft won uh, Pentagon's $10 billion Jedi, Jedi contract, forcing, forcing Amazon or Amazon Web Services. And this is putting putting all of the, uh, the uh, joint um, enterprise defense infrastructure into the cloud. So this is the Pentagon's enterprise cloud solution effectively. So, so I think if it's good enough for the Pentagon, then, then I think that we could, should, take, should take some kind of comfort in that, I think. So, Next slide, please. I'm kind of nearly, nearly from last. I'd like you to uh, meet uh, Rahil. Rahil. A day in the life of Rahil, a pipeline engineer. With a fresh pot of Arabica coffee on the go, Rahil's day is off to a smooth start. But here comes the latest inline inspection data. 10 gigabytes? Looks like you're going to need more of that coffee, Raheel. There's so much data, all with different formatting and so much work to do. But Raheel has an idea. Thea is our new secure integrity management solution in the cloud. Thea makes light work of all the data, utilizing advanced data and engineering analytics to provide useful insights into Raheel's pipelines. Now that Raheel is spending less time managing and formatting data, he can focus on the safe and efficient running of his pipelines. Go on, Raheel, have another coffee. You've earned it. Next slide, please. Oh. <laughs> so just to summarize, digital transformation industry 4.0 concepts, I think I've got a lot of, a lot of to offer the continued safe operating of pipelines. Certainly going to lead to better insights and better decisions. Um, there are some roadblocks, but I think, uh, you know, I think the industry could benefit from closer cooperation. And I think if some of these could be non proprietary, that's of course, uh, it could be a, could be a roadblock. With you know open outputs, and this I think this applies to data standardization, data formats, and protocols. Doing this in an open way, I think, will benefit the industry as a whole. I think the link between engineering and data science is becoming increasingly important, and uh, we can see that from from our own work. And I think that's important in the industry as well. So, and Thea, I think, is very much part of, part of this. You know, we we um, and we're looking really for opportunities to try it out and as, as much as possible to 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 improve it. So. Thank you very much for your uh, your attention, and uh, we have, I think, I believe we have eight minutes left. So happy to answer any questions. 
Thanks very much, Nigel, for the presentation. Um, we've had a few questions come in. Um, the first is, I noticed you do not talk uh, much about risk assessment. Is this the plan? Yes, risk assessment is uh, is an important part of, important part of the year, and that's our next that's our ma next major um, development is going to be in the area area of risk assessment. We're going to be doing it from a from a qualitative point of view um, for for RBI and also a quantitative quantitative point of view as well. So it's we've always, that was always part of the roadmap. We, just, we had to start somewhere. So that's on that's our next major challenge. Yeah, I think uh, risk assessment. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, can you provide Thea in a private cloud environment? Yes, we can absolutely. More, a lot more expenses, of course. But for, for clients that are very, you know, very concerned about security, we can certainly provide it in a cloud. So we can certainly provide it in a cloud environment. Um. Oh, a question just come in as well. Um, is Thea available now? Yes. Yep. It's, it, is, it is available now. We just we, we launched it officially about a month about a month ago. So uh, yes, we, we, there's a there's a request a demo button on the website, so you can click that, and our team will contact you, and, we'll, and we can show we can show it to you. And um, we have a you know, we've got a bit of a roadmap as well, so that you know clients can see what you know what we're planning to add in over the next year or so. So yeah, it's a it's a soft, software as a service on a subscription model. So just log on from a web browser and uh, drag your data in, and then undertake undertake assessments, builds KPIs. It's, you know, it's all it's all there. Fabulous. Thank you very much. If you do have any uh, further questions that you'd like to ask um, our presenter Nigel Kirsten after the webinar, um, I've posted his email address um, in in the Q and A. So feel free to contact him directly. Um, like just to um, round today up. So on behalf of Penspen, um, we hope that you enjoyed the webinar. As mentioned at the beginning, Penspen is running a series of webinars. These will be announced on our Penspen LinkedIn page and website. The next webinar will be on the 18th of November and is entitled QRA for HP Gas Pipelines in Europe. Thank you for joining and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much.